Hey, what's up, guys? It's the HPR Chronicles podcast with Shaquan Smith. We're back. Before I forget, I always forget to say it up front. Please subscribe and like on ICT Group Digital on YouTube. And thank you for listening where you get your podcast, as always. Uh, Smith is a veteran of the Army Reserves. He currently works for the VA. I'm a film and TV producer, director, writer. And together we're the HPR Chronicles podcast with Shaquan Smith. It's the H, it's the P, it's the R, history, politics, and race. And we also cover, uh, you know, news and current affairs and all that good stuff. We try to do it in a fun and interesting way with swag. Let me turn my TV down in the background. In fact, let me just turn it off. Uh, yeah, guys. So we always say, you know, we're not about any race or anything like that, even though we're both Africans or African-Americans or black, whatever your preferred term is. We just about pro truth and the truth defends you with sorry, not sorry, sorry. Not sorry. Yeah, that's our slogan. So yeah, today we're going to cover, and I always say this when we have topics that I'm, I'm able to learn from and was always interested in. And once again, today is one of those days we're covering something that I've always wanted to know more about and in the process of sharing it with you guys and giving our opinion I'm learning about it as well. So I, I like shows like today. And today we're, we're talking about the history of life insurance and how it uh, started with slavery and it derived from slavery and how slavery is what actually made uh, the normal citizens getting it comfortable and having it comfortable. But it all started there when slave owners wanted to insure their slaves and uh, make sure that if they were killed or injured they will be covered and to my surprise which i think uh, smith is going to cover uh, companies like new york life and aig and etna, etna yeah. were all involved with this insuring of, of the slaves and these are major companies today that are worth you know hundreds of millions you know what i mean yes you know and and, it, and, it's, and it's interesting where it all came from Sorry about that. Let me uh, put this on vibrate now. I've been getting a lot of spam calls lately. Anyway, uh, I will, as always, put the links in the description. I'm going to uh, read a few things from insurancejournal.com. I'll put that link in the description. And uh, again, we'll give our opinion and say what we think. And Smith is, is, is going to share some information that he came across from TechCrunch, vi yes, visualizing tech the slave insurance industry. Uh, yeah. So, Smith, how are you doing on this Wednesday? The show comes out Friday. Doing pretty well. Doing pretty well. Can't complain. Just cool. Cool. Nice weather. Good yeah, the weather is nice, man. I'm actually going to uh, miss my second vaccine next week. It was, it's, it's the week that I'm going to be in Louisiana, which reminds me, guys, we may or may not have a show next week. I'm going to take myself to Louisiana and I'll be able to, you know, record a show in the hotel room. Uh, maybe we'll do it. Maybe we won't. But if we miss next week, that's why I'll, I'll be traveling. Uh, so because of that, I'm going to have to do my second vaccine when I come back. Had it been Pfizer, I could have done it this week. Because Pfizer um, is 21 days out. Moderna is 28 days out. Gotcha. You, can, you can take it late, but you can't take it early. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah, and I almost <clears throat> just went and took it early. Mm -hmm. But I said, you know what? Let me not mess with this stuff, man. I mess around and, 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 and take it early and end up Throw like another this. head. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I said, so let me follow instructions. Uh yeah, let me follow instructions and just just take it later. Yeah. So that's, that's what's good. going on with me, man. Uh, yeah, like you say, good weather here in wine country. Yeah, looking forward to uh, some more of it. Yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. So yeah, let's let's, uh, let's jump go. into it if you're ready. <clears throat> I'm ready. You want me to do the American Journal first? Sure. I mean, the Insurance uh, Journal first. Yeah, go ahead. I'm I'm not gonna go it's over the. Or do you want me to go first? The with first the... part of it. Yeah, you yeah, you can because I, I think yours gives a more general overview of what took place. Okay. And the insurance journal, I like how it get it, it gave samples of some cases that, you know, yeah. claims were made and 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 you know, uh, 
uh, they were able to, you know, pay out on those claims or not. You know what yeah. I mean? Okay, so this was, I found this on techcrunch.com. Yeah. And as you mentioned, <clears throat> the title is Visualizing the Slave Insurance Industry. So I'm just going to um, like hit some keynote key points into it. And um, similar to the way people insure their cars, houses, and lives. I'm sorry. Slave owners would sometimes insure their slaves fearful for of not getting their money's worth um, from their slaves, owners would sometimes take out insurance policies on them. In the 1800s, for example, some slave owners would rent out their slaves, would insure them so that in the event that their slaves died or were severely injured in the hands of someone else, the owners would not suffer too much of an economic loss. Mm -hmm. um, slave owners sometimes relied on financial firms like Aetna, AIG and New York Life Insurance to ensure the, the slaves whose skills were highly valued. In Alabama, New York Life, which was known as the Nautilus Insurance Company at the time, was the largest, largest slave insurer according to, according to the Treasury of Weary Souls. Between 1845 and 1849, New York Life insurance so policies to slaveholders to insure their slaves against damage or death by the 1840s the number of slaves insured in the south was about the same as the number of free whites with life insurance accord <clears throat> and then of that number um he um the researcher found and his name's or last name is ralph um that he never saw any plantation slaves insured in his um, in the seven years of researching 1,300 um, policies. So even though plantation slaves were valuable in the marketplace, they were never insured. They were viewed more as livestock. They enhanced the value of the plantation, but their skills weren't seen as valuable or premium. Instead, slave owners would insure coal miners, blacksmiths, carpenters, railroaders, rail, rail, I'm sorry, railroad workers and their slaves were, and other slaves with value skills. Miners, for example, example made up 15.4% of the insured slave work, workforce, according to the project. Steamboat workers accounted for 12.6% of those insured and domestic workers accounted for 14.6% of the insured slave population, according to the ledger. In January 1855, a slave owner by the um, name of Thomas Doswell insured seven slaves to work in the coal pits in what is now West Virginia. Two of the older slaves were insured for 500 each, and the younger ones were insured for 700 each. In 1855, the average price for a slave was 600, according to the research. Right. So, um, so, 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 like, so, like, just to be clear for our audience, real quick, when they say. Yeah they wouldn't insure plantation slaves. That doesn't mean that a carpenter on the plantation wouldn't be insured. It's just that the plantation slaves wouldn't be insured, the yes. ones with no special skills. Correct. So the ones right. that would be that were picking um, cotton or well, tobacco. Something simple. Simple. Something, like something. It was either sim simple or considered too dangerous. So right. if it was a, a, too dangerous of a task, they weren't going to insure them because they knew They'd be, the insurance company probably wouldn't. They, which, they would be have to pay out because which they were I'll get into when I do my my side yeah. of right exactly. Okay, but you know one thing. Um, well, I'll go back to it. Just um, mm -hmm. so what is very kind of interesting about it is is the that the um, ledgers show that skilled slaves who built America so they were still. Um, forced to work for free. It's not mm -hmm. like they were getting paid anything, mm -hmm. um, except for if something happened, the slave owners got it. But these slaves did have more mobility than plantation slaves. Sometimes right. they were able to negotiate their work schedules and other ter terms of forced labor. Um, the market for slave insurance was mostly in urban areas. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much um, the stuff I was going to talk talk about but it was interesting like you said to research this and find out that there is a difference like it wasn't just plant which most people just think oh everyone was picking cotton you know there mm -hmm. was of course you know people who were inside homes taking care of those and then like you said carpenters I didn't even know about coal mine coal miners I assume blacksmiths but 
you know, which is why I remember that discussion we had on our last names or names and stuff like that. And I said, mm-hmm. blacksmith, uh, that's probably where mm-hmm. our names came from. But mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that's it's just very interesting. It was very eye opening. So Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. Yeah. Thanks for that, Smith. And let me dig into this piece that I have here. Uh, and so so so, guys, what I'm going to do is just kind of go through some of the cases, which I thought was very interesting, like how they would ensure the slaves and incidents that would happen. And I actually saw a few incidences here that I think would make a great film. Actually, if you are going to do another slave movie, to me, it should be a liberating one similar to Django. I still say Django and Chain is one of the best slave movies ever done. <laughs> that and 12 years of slave. Okay. It's not the same narrative showing us just, you know, weak and being beaten down and whipped and chains and 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 in and in service. Like, you know, Django was one of those liberating slaves slave movies where Jamie Foxx's character fought back and escaped and freed him and he and his wife. And those are the things we need to see. To me, those stories are, are, are the ones that are, are important if you're going to talk about slavery. So one of these I'm going to go over, I thought would make a great film. So I <laughs> just want to say that real quick. Anyway, so life insurance, I'm not going to start at the top. There are a smattering of reported cases about life insurance upon slaves. My big worry was moral hazard. For, fortunately, no reported cases considered this issue. The fact that there are no reported cases suggests that it was, perhaps, it was perhaps not a big problem. From an insurance standpoint, the cases are fairly routine. In one case, the life of a slave was insured so long as he was not engaged in an occupation more dangerous than being a laborer in a tobacco warehouse, or so long as he was not south of New Orleans, which I thought was interesting, which is what Smith just was talking about, the whole tobacco thing. Uh, the man died when he fell off a riverboat traveling from New Orleans so that he could work on a sugar plantation. The insurer refused to pay upon the grounds that he was on his way to a more dangerous occupation. The Louisiana Supreme Court ruled that the slave was not involved in that occupation yet and was not south of New Orleans, and so the insurance applied. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Because he wasn't Mm -hmm. there yet. Yeah. So, So the insurer had to end up paying out to the slave owner. In another case, insurance agents sued on a note in South Carolina. The note was exchanged in Massachusetts for life insurance upon a slave. In Massachusetts, insurance upon slaves was void by statute. Mm -hmm. Consequently, the South Carolina Supreme Court held that the note was unenforceable because Massachusetts law applied. The, The court also noted that there was some evidence that the insurer had not charged the agent's account for the unpaid premium. Apparently the agent had guaranteed the premium. In another case, a slave escaped and was then shot to death by a properly deputized member of a posse, which I wanna, which I wanna cover that term posse too and where it came from in another show. The insurance policy contained exclusions for death resulting from insurrection. We've heard that word recently, Mm -hmm. (laughs) riot or civil commotion or any military or or usurped authority or by the hands of justice. The North Carolina Supreme Court held that the death of the slave was not part of any insurrection, riot or civil commotion that it quite obviously did not result from military action and that it did not result from justice because there was no valid ju- judicial order in place. Mm-hmm. Consequently, North Carolina mutual life had to pay. The act of the deputy was shocking, of course, but the insurance law decision was correct. Although moral hazard problems lurk in the shadows. That's very, you know, it, it, that that's interesting, man. Like a slave is escaping, gets shot, and this idiot got paid got paid paid out for that. But the weird now, part. Now imagine that. And and, and 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 if this slave was married or had kids, they didn't get nothing. Yeah. You know what I mean? But the weird part in that is that it was a deputized deputy yeah, deputized member of a posse, which you would think 
but I guess right. they didn't have they weren't really part of they weren't le- law. I mean, right. it's weird. Like, I do want to understand more about posses because I thought. Yeah, because the posses were the ones who would round up, you know, they would go out. Yeah, but I thought it was and- like um, like the sheriff or whatever would get the posse to help him. So these were supposed to be deputies of. They were. Of, yeah. Or it was more like the other show we did, which were the. Uh, um, slave officers. Or right, right, like right. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I honestly think they were one and the same sometimes. Yeah. Some posse members weren't deputies mm-hmm. or officers and some were. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So so let's go to this next section. There are, there are also several mm-hmm. cases involving property insurance. Interestingly, all of these cases arose in the context of the slave trade. Insurance in this context must have been quite common. The fact that many anti-slavery maritime sta- states outlawed insurance upon slaves in transit suggests that the practice was common and therefore economically important. So this is the part that's that's interesting to me. In one case, a ship, ca- and I never knew incidents like this happened. This, this was crazy to learn. In one case, a ship carrying slaves put into Hamilton, Bermuda for repairs in 1835. The British government freed all 78 slaves on board, and one slave owner made a claim for $26,000, resulting from the loss of his 38 slaves. The insurance company denied coverage on the grounds that the vessel was unseaworthy. The Court of Appeals of, of the Court of Appeals Law of South Carolina held in 1838 that the jury correctly decided that the ship was seaworthy that the loss of the slaves was attributed to the actions of the chief justice of Bermuda and therefore fell within coverage. Now that's interesting. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, and the thing that trips me out too is how the, how the British government, because the ship had to come in for repairs, freed all the slaves. And, yeah. and, and you want to know, you want to know what that made me think instantly that came to mind. What? I bet you, I bet you it was dangerous for them to just hold them there on port. And instead mm-hmm. of even dealing with it, and they probably were in fear of like some uprising or something because they weren't in a, they didn't hadn't made it to America yet. Okay. I bet you that's why the U, the UK was like, just free them. You know what I'm saying? I, I think Be, they because if you think about it, right? If so, if, if a mm-hmm. ship comes in to for repairs, I'm sure they probably have to risk taking all the slaves out. So the ship could be repaired. They probably couldn't just stay in there. So, oh, <laughs> I see what you're saying. Yes, yeah, so I bet you they were like, instead of even dealing with that, just free them. You know what I'm saying? And and yeah. and and the chief and the 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 slave owner, uh, he probably was like, he had to listen because he was from Britain. He had to listen to the government and was like, but I want to be paid for my 38 slaves that I lost. Yeah, it's, or it's, it's crazy. Go ahead. Or it was just, you know, the sh- I mean, it could be the ship, like they said, had 78. But this one who was making the claim, he only had the 38 that he right. could actually either, right. either he, it was all his all his slaves or maybe he had 38 slaves coming off the boat. So he wasn't the one actually, um, you know, had he probably was waiting for them to show up. And then when they showed up, they were like, Pro- probably they got. You know, so how, but either way, is that's interesting. I, I wonder, and I, maybe we need to do that. Is when did slavery end, end or how bad in, was in in Britain? In Bermuda too. Yeah, in See, Bermuda. Yeah, and and in Bermuda. Yeah, craziness, man. <laughs> we find <laughs> Let me out keep going. Lot. Yeah, by by far the most complex case of this sort is a group of cases that first came before the Louisiana Supreme Court in 1845. All of these cases are clustered around one of them styled, ironically enough, McCargo versus New Orleans Insurance Company. Wow. There were several cases because there were a lot of slaves on one ship. They were owned by different people, kind of what you were just trying to say. Yeah. But all apparently insured under the same policy. Oh, of course, this fact suggests that slave policies were, bro- were broke I think brokerage is what they probably wanted. Probably to say. they meant to say, yeah, through shipmasters, yeah, who no doubt received some sort of commission. Mm-hmm. Uh, in McCargo, a ship left Virginia with a large number of slaves. A male slave was caught in the female ship hold. 
he led a successful revolt. This is the movie I want to make. <laughs> he uh -huh. led a successful revolt of some sort during which there was one casualty. The slaves chopped off the head of the overseer, threw his corpse overboard, and then sailed to the Bahamas. This is the movie that I want to make. It, it reminds yeah. me of Django. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Or what's the other he got one? got caught with, with a woman. They ended up taking over, chopping the head off of the overseer, throwing him overboard, and taking the ship to, 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 to the Bahamas. That's a story, man. Yeah. Anyway, let me keep going, guys. That there, is. <laughs> yeah. There, the British authorities freed all of the slaves except. So see, so when they got so when they got to the Bahamas, the British authorities freed all of the slaves except those involved in the murder of the overseer, and the vast majority of them departed. The slave owners sought coverage with the which the insurer denied. You know what I mean? Yeah. As it has always been the case in insurance and always probably will be, once the insurer decided the coverage should be denied, it did not so upon every reason it could think of. Consequently, New Orleans insurance denied coverage for a lot of reasons. One, insurance never commenced since slaves were loaded at a port <laughs> other than the one warranted. Two, the ship was not seaworthy or lack of sufficient guard on the slaves. Three, the insurrection of slaves constituted a breach of warranty. Four, slave insurrection constituted an, an, an expected risk. Five, the voyage was abandoned by going to the Bahamas. Six, departure of slaves constituted an, expe an accepted risk, namely... Elopement. Elopement, i.e. voluntary departure. Seven, the insurrection by the slaves constituted an act of piracy which is an accepted risk. And eight, liability was excluded under the policy because it arose in performance of criminal acts. Wow. Some of these, some of these issues were trivial while some were extremely important. One of the important issues was seaworthiness. An incompetent crew renders a vessel unseaworthy. The insurer maintained that there was insufficient guard on the slaves and hence the vessel was unseaworthy. The jury resolved this question against the insurer, however. That's what I was saying about the first thing. I think when they got to Bermuda, mm -hmm. maybe they didn't have enough guards or whatever. And they were like, yeah. British Britain was like, let them go. If, yeah. if, they, if, if we had to stop to fix the ship, let them go. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Another crucial issue concerned the nature of the insurance itself. Foreign interference was a significant risk that was insured against, but the, but the insurance wanted the coverage to be free from elopement, insurrection, and natural death. The principal question in this case concerned insurrection. As is common in property insurance cases, the court found a way to say that what appeared to be a warranty, a warranty wasn't really a warranty. However, it was treated as an exclusion and the Louisiana court held that there certainly was an insurrection and that the coverage was therefore defeated. Wow. The policyholders argued that the insurrection was not the proximate cause of the loss. Instead, they claimed that the acts of the British government in the Bahamas were the cause of the loss. The Louisiana Supreme Court showed little patience with this argument. To be sure, insurrection was not immediate cause of loss, was not the immediate cause of loss, but it was part of the casual process and therefore coverage defeating. Courts today still grapple with analogous issues. In addition, the court said that when the slaves turned the ship from its route to New Orleans and headed for the Bahamas, they had abandoned the voyage for which insurance was issued. The policyholders argued that it was not their fault that the destination was changed, and hence they did not abandon the voyage. Wow. <laughs> the court rejected this argument and pointed out that slave owners are legally responsible for the acts of their slaves. Wow. Oh. In the end, it's crazy, right? <laughs> yeah. This is crazy, man. <clears throat> uh, where, where is, where is it? In the end, the Louisiana Supreme Court reversed the commercial court of New Orleans on the issue of insurrection. As a legal decision, this holding was virtually compelled by the facts. On the other hand, when this lengthy decision is viewed as a political document, the court was clearly quite hostile to slavery as an institution. Mm. The court mm. observed that slavery is contrary to natural law, that it was completely predictable that slaves would try to escape. Who would no. not, after all? 
And that from the point of view of the fundamentals of insurance law, cargo was not usually insurable against inherent vice and that the desire for liberty on the part of slaves was very much like an inherent vice. In other words, the court was fundamentally unsympathetic to the interests of the slave owners. That's so interesting, man. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, guys, oh, I mean, go, go ahead. Oh, just one thing. It, it shows that um, insurance companies, they screw up over everybody, no matter when, where, exactly. what. Exactly, and what they, history of time. Isn't that, they, isn't that interesting? Yeah. They automatically are trying to deny a coverage. Not, yeah. Uh, you, you know, the moral aspect of it is just one thing, but it's just interesting as far as, you know, just how insurance companies do things. Like, wow. Right, 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 right. <clears throat> Uh, what I was going to say in conclusion, I was wondering if this was worth bringing up or not. It says it would be interesting to know what the unreported court cases look like. Yeah, it would be. Yeah. <laughs> this could be determined by reviewing trial records in Southern states for litigation between slave owners and insurance companies involving policies covering slaves. Unfortunately, history buffs tell me that many of the courthouses in which those records would have been stored were burned in the course of the Civil War. I did want to mention this part. It would also be interesting to get a look at the claims files of insurance companies which covered slaves during the first 60 years of the 19th century. Unfortunately, yeah. I haven't the faintest idea where to look for those records, and my bet is they are mostly gone with the wind. Wow. Well, I think um, the New York life seems to have a bunch of stuff that it doesn't have the early part, but it does have some stuff from um, right, right, right. Eighteen hundred or yeah, yeah. That that is so interesting, man. And and again, you know, again, like like I said at the top of the show, I love covering stuff where I get to learn something new as well. You know, I mean, I always knew about this, but never knew exactly how it would work. And damn sure didn't know about all these cases that existed, <laughs> all these things that happened, and how. And I didn't know that the court usually favored the slaves i didn't know well, that. they didn't and really it was really favored the insurance companies yeah that's yeah. who they really favor and because you I mean, know insurance companies they're in the business of making money and not paying out because right. they're paying out they're losing money yeah. so everyone knows they don't like to pay out so that's really what it was about they, they were in favor of the insurance companies i mean there was one that's that stated it was um they felt that you know uh, slavery was not a good thing but you know, it's it would just I, I, I'm just going to switch it back and say that would be a good movie. Yeah, it would be <laughs> right. The, the one yeah. the one about the Bahamas. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Really good movie. And you bring the insurance aspect in and all that. In yeah. The court Courts. And, that would be a great movie. Yeah. Really, really good. Yeah, I'm definitely going to write that down and and copy and paste that part of the thing for notes for later. That's something I'm going to have to tackle. Yeah, that was interesting, man. I mean, as far as my opinion on the whole thing before we sign off is, mm -hmm. you know, of course, I think it's ridiculous and a travesty that this took place. And that's how insurance came about. Another thing that derived from from an injustice that was done to the Africans that, that were brought here and all around the world. You know what I mean? And it's also a shame that, you know, the families didn't, you know, benefit from that the way life insurance is today. Yeah. You know, I have life insurance, you know what I'm saying? That covers mm -hmm. my mother, my daughter, if something happens to me and so on and so forth. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. And, and it would have been nice, which we knew would, could never happen and would never happen if the families of these slaves, whatever, whatever family they did have at these plantations, because as we know, families were broke broken up. up and separated. So whatever family they did have if they got lucky like that on these pants it would have been nice if they actually benefited from it and not the the slave owners i mean that's all i really have to say about the whole thing yeah well again what i um was thinking earlier was just amazing how it uh, yeah just growing up you always felt it was just slave um slaves in a, um in cotton fields picking cotton all day mm -hmm. but it's interesting to know that there was sugar plantation, there was tobacco, coal mining, yeah. carpet, yeah. all those other things, but Carbons that people were doing, um, which now it makes sense when slavery ended, how some people were able to 
do things and build their communities because they mm -hmm. were doing stuff and they were free labor. You know, th that's the one thing that just needs to be, you know, understood. And like you said, you feel bad for the families where they obviously lost a, a loved one. And let's, let's say they were somewhat trying to raise a family together, even mm -hmm. though it was slavery. Yeah. They got no benefits from that. And right. this again shows the, um, the disparity of how uh, wealth was handled throughout yep, even our nation, from back then. you know? So yeah. not only were, I mean, obviously we were brought in, I know I say we Africans were brought in to, to provide free labor, but you know, um, Hispanics and eight and Chinese or the Asians were brought in and they were also um, exploited in different ways. They were given money, but once they, once America's and, and, you know, whites were scared of them losing their jobs, which they weren't because they weren't doing those jobs anyway, then mm -hmm. they wanted to get rid of them and send them right. back to somewhere. So exactly. <clears throat> Craziness, man. Anyway, yeah. Smith, another good show, brother. Thanks yes. for checking in. Thank you. This is one I'm going to listen back to. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. For sure. While I'm in my car headed to LA and stuff like that, definitely going to listen back to this show. Uh, yeah, guys, don't forget to subscribe on ICT Group Digital. Like and subscribe. Give us some thumbs up. Hit that notification bell. Thank you for listening where you get your podcasts. And don't forget to follow us on social media. You know, it's HPR Chronicles podcast with Shaquan Smith. And if you didn't know where life insurance came from, now you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll put the links in the description. And like we always say, guys, go out there, research on your own. Yes. You know, te teach your kids this stuff because they're only teaching them a skewed version of the history and history of slavery and all that stuff in schools, especially if you're an, if you're an African kid. So, again, like we always say, all kids should know it, even even the white yeah. kids. And it's been, yeah, they all should know it, yep. you know, but especially for us, we definitely should know our, know our uh, history. So on that note, uh, Smith, thanks for checking in once again. Thank you. And I'll see you next time again, guys. We may or may have a show show next week. Uh, if not, you'll see us the week after. All right. Good Peace. stuff. Peace out. I'll talk to you soon, Smith. You too.